loves, it's Ro. Welcome back. Today we have another installment of the video series with Michael and Carol Santos. I'm actually posting these out of order because I already edited three or four other ones that they had sent, but I wanted to come in and make this intro and add it before I post any more of the other ones because there are some things that you guys commented on the other one that I just wanted to speak to. So Michael did 26 years inside a federal prison. They were together for a year before they got married. They were married for 10 years while he was inside. And now since he's been released, it's been seven or eight. So almost 10 years in, almost 10, no, definitely 10 years in, almost 10 years out. And they're sharing a whole bunch of stuff about reentry and issues that they've experienced. And they're answering all questions that you guys sent over for them. Now in the first one, the intro one that I posted, last week, a couple of people had commented about Michael is so in love with her. You could tell she just seems not sure of herself. Who knows if she really is into this? Are you guys sure? There were a whole bunch of comments like that. And I spoke to Carol about this yesterday or the day before. And you guys have to remember, not everybody likes to be in front of the camera. Not everybody is an in front of the scenes kind of person. And Carol is a behind the scenes person. She's a shy individual. She's introverted by nature. And it takes a lot for her to feel comfortable in front of the camera. She swallowed all of that and she got in front of the camera and she did this series with Michael because she knows what it's like to be in our shoes and she wanted to share her experiences and their story in order to help us. So that's the only reason that maybe she's coming across a little bit reserved. I said, my thought was, well, maybe he steals the spotlight. And I'm not saying that about Michael. I'm saying that about me. When I'm in front of the camera, I told Adam this on a call one time. I was like, here's what's happening. I told him about Michael and Carol because he's so excited about this series. And I was like, I know that's gonna be me one day. And he's like, but when we, when we do our recorded calls, he's like, I can tell when you're on. And we have, as people in front of the camera, we had to work up this camera presence, right? We have had to build up to this for years. You guys have seen what I was like way back in the day when I was like, um, you know, I'm here to visit Adam today. And, um, well, this is, um, it's just hard to get in front of a camera. And then you work at it and you work at it, you work at it. And for some people, we fall into this. And for some people, you're like, not my thing. I don't want to do this. I don't like this, any of this. So let's appreciate Carol for what she has to share. Let's not dissect their relationship. If they were unhappy, they would not be doing this, first of all. Second of all, it's not really our business to dissect their relationship. I hope you understand what I'm saying. I'm not coming down on anybody. I just wanted to be above and beyond in clarifying that because I don't wanna come across disrespectfully to my guests on my channel. Not that she felt came after. I'm just being protective because you guys know me. I'll protect each and every one of my people. Adam calls me a pit bull all the time. It's just how I am. It's my nature. I'm defensive of the people I care about and love. Okay, let's not waste any more time. In this video, Michael and Carol talk about relationships, le relationship logistics. Let's say that 10 times fast. That is a tongue twister and a half, you guys. Clearly, I've been in quarantine for way too long because I need to like speak to people more. I can't, well, who am I kidding? I can't speak ever, but relationship logistics. So they talk about things like family dynamics, how their families responded to them getting married while they're inside and merging into one another's families. They also talk about trust issues, finances, trying to avoid parole. So we just kind of took all of your questions and organized them as best as we could and categorized them for individual videos. So this one is basically relationship dynamic. Stay tuned for the intimacy one coming very, very, very soon. That was my favorite one so far, but without wasting any more time, here are Michael and Carol. Show them some love in the comments below. Give this video a thumbs up so it's shared out to people who need it. Oh, and one last thing. I just got this new Adam necklace. Like, are you, are you dying? Are you dead? Do you need one too? Yes, you need one too. Mm -hmm. A personalized necklace. Like I cannot wait to wear this to visit. So I got you guys a discount code from the company. Links are affiliate, just so you know. I might make a little commission off of whatever they sell, not much, but just wanna be fully transparent with you guys about that. All of it is in the description box below. Go get you one, because I love this thing. I never wanna take it off. Okay, enjoy this video.
Hello, strong prison wives and family. Ro Clausen, we really thank you for giving us this opportunity of sharing the amazing journey that began for my wife, Carol, and me while we were inside of a federal prison visiting room where we married on June the 24th, 2003. Say hi, Carol. Hi, everyone. We really enjoyed doing the first episode, and now we are going to continue working through these questions from strong prison wives and families with hopes of giving some insight of what we experience. It's not what everybody experiences. We got married inside of a prison, and we've been nurturing our marriage ever since. So, Carol, do you want to continue just by uh, reading the question, or do you want me to read this question no, since it's for question. you? Okay. How has your relationship dynamic changed since he got out? Is he having a tough time transitioning and finding a job? How is it transitioning for the wife, too, going from being independent and having your space to having him home? Well, the biggest change in the relationship dynamic is that we're not in a prison visiting room anymore. We're in our home. We're alone. Um, for the first 10 years of our relationship, we couldn't um, embrace or kiss except for coming in and leaving the room. And then it, there were always um, cameras in the ceiling and guards and the stress of wondering if, you know, they were going to think we were doing something or, or um, hassle us during our visit. So that dynamic completely changed as soon as we were able to be away from that kind of um, oversight and you know we live in our home we're together all the time and uh, it's very comfortable so that was a really nice change um, I'll let him answering answer about um, transitioning and finding a job for me it was an easy transition I, I was independent I was working as a nurse um, and continued to do that for quite a while now I work with Michael, um, and so we're home together all the time, and of course the quarantine's happening right now. Um, so we, we um, share our space comfortably, and that was really not an issue when he came home. I was happy to have him home. I have another question, Carol. It's, did they have challenges with trust or money? And I'm going to start on that because I think it's your husband's responsibility to make sure that you've, you've, you've saved that trust and you've built that trust because trust is something to be earned. And I really worked hard to earn Carol's trust when I was in prison. How did I do it? I laid out the goals that I wanted to do with her. I wrote her every day. I told her, this is what you can expect from me when I'm in prison. And when I come home, you know, we always had this like timeline that we were building together. And that's how we built trust. And then when we came home and we started living together, I, you know, was with her all the time because I really needed her. So I never had any issues with trust or with money. Um, in prison or beyond. I don't know. I'm, I, I, maybe you have the same or different, but I mean, I really worked hard to earn your trust because I felt I had that duty. And I always trusted you and I always wanted to have your trust. And I, I think I made my life really centered around your environment and made conscious choices about how I was going to spend my time. And I made sure that you always knew where I was and we were very open and um, had an ongoing dialogue through our letters about what was happening in my world, what was happening in his world. And so there was never an issue of wondering, um, you know, what's he doing or where is he or for him, where is she um, or what or, she's or doing? What am I doing? We and were very, that, that was one of the things, honey, that I think that you made it so easy for us to trust each other is that Carol was in school for a long period of time. So you were working toward these very clear objectives of getting her going through algebra and science. And, and then we shared with that, right? So we built trust, I think, by working together, even while I was in prison. And by the time I came home, she was as comfortable to me as my own skin and it, and she still is that's true and and it was really conscious choices so if 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 there are trust issues it can make it really hard i would think to be on the outside 
um, for the person who's in prison wondering what's happening on the outside, and then for the for the person on the outside wondering, you know, what's going on inside, who's he writing to, you know, who's <laughs> he having visits with. I mean, we just, I didn't have any of those trust concerns, um, and Michael's incredibly loyal and faithful and loving, and he's been that way from the first time I communicated with him to sitting right here today that's never changed so you know it's 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 how our relationship um, the foundation of our relationship is built on trust so so if you're nurturing a relationship with somebody in prison that's something that needs to be worked on from the very beginning at least that's what worked for us so I would agree with Carol no challenges with trust or money Mm -mm. other challenges that probably are going to come up in other questions but certainly not that but I will say that Other challenges are much easier to navigate and get through because we do have trust and we do have a solid foundation um, of uh, in our relationship. So it's it's easier to navigate the challenges that did come up. Okay, the next question asks us how to avoid violating parole and how to find resources. So I'm going to let you start. Well, violating parole is, is if you can get through prison, you can avoid parole violations simply by understanding how does it work. And it's really important to understand that. When, when the person comes home, he's going to have a meeting with a supervised release uh, off a probation officer. And that person is going to, the first thing he's going to do is he's going to read these check marks off of, do you understand this? Do you understand this? Do you understand this? And it's really important not just to skip over that. Um, For example, I do a lot of work to try and help people who come out. And just last weekend, I had to interact with a guy who is about to go back to prison because he did violate the terms of his supervised release. And this is what he did. He simply filled out a credit card application. It doesn't seem like a real big crime, okay? It doesn't seem like a crime at all, but it's going to result in him extending his supervised release by 18 months and the judge sent him back to prison for 90 days. Now, that, that, the really sad thing about that is it didn't happen to this fella until he was on the, he had a 36-month supervised release. It didn't happen to him until his 35th month. That's when the probation officer pulled his credit report, saw that he uh, filled out an application for a credit card, and as a result of seeing that on the credit report, the guy's going back to prison. And that's really awful, but it's happening because this guy didn't really understand that that was the type of thing that could result in you going back to prison. So it's very important to understand whatever rules are going to govern your supervision because when you're released, you're released on, uh, in accordance with the, that, that subset of arrangements. So it may mean that you can't associate with other people who have a felony background. That wasn't the case for me because I did work around that. But I always communicated with my probation officer by saying, can I do this? Is this okay? I, and I want to understand what are your expectations of me so that I can live up to those expectations. And you also want to be really clear about what are you trying to do with your life? Because it's a fundamentally different aspect being on supervised release as it is being in prison. When you're in prison or even the halfway house, the objective is always to squash your your hope and your spirit and tell you, you know, you're still serving time. You're still an inmate, okay? But once you transition, you move from the from the prison system or the executive branch of government into the judicial branch and you will with a probation officer. That's not to say it's a piece of cake, but the probation officer's theoretical job is to help you get established in society. And I can only say my experience, if you're honest and if you're working a legitimate employment and you're not associating with other people who are violating the law, you're going to have a pretty easy time. If you're living on the edge, you can expect that probation officer to be very cynical of you and and look at you a lot differently, and that can result in more complications, including going back to prison. I was very fortunate that I had, I was living effectively with a probation officer, <laughs> and she she 
she was very tough. So I, you know, I, I mean, I didn't do anything anyway, but my wife is just like hyper conscious of anything that could threaten our stability. She was that way when I was in prison. And I think it's important to know also for the family and the wife or the loved one that before your loved one comes home, the probation officer is going to want to see your environment. They're going to want to meet you. Before Michael came home um, for his, the last part of his home confinement, um, they went through my car and they even looked in my gas tank. So you, you have to be aware that they're going to be snooping around and they're going to want to see everything and meet everyone. So just be prepared for that and, um, you know, and you'll get through that part of it. Now, how to find resources. I think this is, this is important both when they're inside prison and outside prison. And this is something that um, you can do. We're very lucky to have the internet now. Um, I've said that the best way I was able to advocate for Michael was always to know the BOP policies. And I used their website a lot to download policy statements and read um, A&O documents. Anytime he was transferred, I wanted to learn everything about the facility he was going to and what their visiting policies were. And if he was in transit and I was visiting in a detention center, how is that set up? All of that information is available online on the BOP website, BOP.gov. And then as far as when, when someone comes home, it's, you know, it's important to know kind of ahead of time, are there medical issues? Are there social services needs? And you want to do that research ahead of time so that if you need those resources, community resources, family resources, healthcare resources, housing resources, you've already looked ahead and done your research and, and there's tons and tons of information available online um, just by searching the internet. Um, and th those are the kind of resources that are helpful to have ahead of time. Yeah, so I, I hope that answers your question. I think that the wife can play a big role in making sure that the husband is understanding how to really cherish liberty. Um, I, <clears throat> for us, it was, it was really easy because we were very close and having spent so much time in prison, I was very grateful to have opportunity alone time and didn't really want to mix with a lot of people anyway. <laughs> there you go. Next question. Okay, so the next question is how to handle family dynamics after release and how did their families and friends handle the marriage? I'll let you start. <laughs> well, that was a very tough, that's a very tough thing for us. Um, I made a promise to Carol, I'll hold your hand right now, honey. Um, when she came into my life, and I may have touched on this in the previous video, but I'm, I'm happy to say it again because this is an area where I really failed Carol and I hurt her. And it makes me sad that I can't really undo that. Um, I was in prison for my about 15 years or 16 years when she came into my life. And during that time, I, I, I've, and really through all my life, I've been very close with my, uh, my, both of my sisters um, my father had passed away already, and my mother and I were, you know, close enough, I'd say close, but, but it was really close with my sisters. And when Carol came into my life, you know, she gave up everything to be a part of my life. She was going to move from Oregon to New Jersey and tie her life to mine in every single way. And I was so close with my sisters that I promised Carol, I said, it's going to be amazing. You're going to have two new sisters. You're not just marrying me. And, and Carol was really excited about that, about, about really being a part of a, of, a, of a loving family. And unfortunately, my sisters, you know, didn't embrace Carol the way that she wanted to be embraced. And it, it was unfair of me to tell Carol that to expect this when I had no right to be talking about how other people would receive this really unusual prison family. 
And for me, she had you know, a brother who was a judge, a dad who was a dentist, and a sister that was a Hollywood executive. And I knew that they weren't going to accept me as a prisoner. I understood that. And I had no expectations of them ever expecting me as a prisoner. In fact, I remember when we first started, I told you, hey, son, there are going to be people that are going to judge you because you're falling in love with a guy who's been in jail for 15 or 16 years and still has 10 years to go. And she was so in love with me at that time. I wonder if it hasn't changed. (laughs) But she only saw the good in me. And so the family dynamic issue has just been a really difficult one that has brought many scars to, to Carol. And no matter how hard I try to heal them, and even to some extent, no matter how hard my family, we've been together now for six and a half years, can try to heal them, it's, it's very hard to wash away that struggle and that challenge. And, and so it's been difficult for us because I'm still very, very close to my sister's. And, and when I, to the extent of that closeness makes you feel, I think, and I try to understand you excluded from something. And even though I try to include her, I can't because the pain is very deep and I want to try to protect her from that. And that's what I try. But that is one of the issues that has been very hard on us. And it's only our love and our commitment and our trust that, that carries it through. Um, I, I think that's fair the way I said it, but I'll let you talk. That's fair. Um, yeah. Whew. This is probably the hardest thing that we struggle with. And when I joined my life to Michael, I, I made a conscious choice and I knew that I would be, you know, people would look at me and think I was crazy. And certainly, you know, my friends and my family thought I was nuts when I moved. Um, but I knew what I was doing and I knew why I was doing it. Um, and I was perfectly okay with their decision, you know, to, to feel the way they felt. Um, eventually over the years, I think maybe six, seven years into it, they started to say, oh, wow, that they're, they're still together and, you know, they're thriving and, and then kind of started to come around. But, Um, I I think the issue for me with Michael's family was I was just so hurt that I was rejected because I fell in love with their brother who was in prison. And so I I felt um, always excluded from their close relationship uh, as if, and it's, you know, it's hard always being called you know, my brother's wife and not my sister-in-law or, you know, not being a part of their children's lives growing up. And that's something that was in and is incredibly painful for me um, because I came with a whole open heart and excited and really wanted to be a part of a, of a wonderful family. And that's what I that's what I thought. That's what he told me. And I, I believed that and trusted that. And, you know, as he says, he, he didn't have the right to promise me that. And I was so in love with him. I didn't even consider that they might not look at me as being good for their brother. So it, it was very hard and very painful. And, um, you know, it's just something that I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know what's going to happen or, or how things will evolve over the years. Um, but it's, it's definitely the biggest hurdle and challenge that we struggle with in our marriage because of the pain. Yeah, I, and, 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 I, and I will say also from the other side of that, I, I, it's very important for me to protect Carol and for me to help Carol, I, but it was my fault for not understanding the pain that she goes through. Um, I always understood my sisters and I've known them my whole life and I don't see them as rejecting Carol, but I, it's not important what I see. What's important is what she feels and I have to try to heal that and it's not easy to do. So I don't know what the person that asked me that question, if they're having similar challenges. I know it's hard for a lot of people in society to understand what it means to be a strong prison wife. I can only say 
for me that Carol was the center of my life. And I'm very grateful to her for being with me. And I'm very sorry, even today, that she suffers from, from those memories because she was with me for 10 years. And now it's been 18 years. And I'm sad that she still doesn't feel as if she's part of my family. But to me, she's the center of my life. That's the question. That's the answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The next category is intimacy. Michael and Carol are amazing. It's so validating maybe to hear that they share the same struggles and how they got through them. They're successful all of these years later. If you're interested in watching the first video in this series, just click that video right up there. And if you're not already subscribed, can you please subscribe? Click that little circle up there, or you could always do so by clicking the red box below. I love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one.